Hello and welcome, and thank you for joining me in this week's devotions. As we're going through the Paul's letter to the Ephesians, we've looked at chapters 1, 2, and most of chapter 3. We're looking at really the closing section of chapter 3, uh, which will probably pretty much take up all of our devotionals this week. Um, but one of the things I want to uh, really begin going back through doing is kind of a little bit of a, a, a a rehashing of what we've looked at to try to keep the context in view. Um, Paul began in chapter 1 writing about the, the believer's position in Christ, and he meant that both individually and collectively. Um, it's important for us when we read about the, uh, Paul's guidance to the believers as individuals that he also understands that to be a kind of a corporate concept. In other words, in our day and age, we tend to separate individuals from any kind of organization or collective, our emphasis upon individual liberty and freedoms and so forth. But we fail oftentimes to see that within that liberty, there's a certain obligation or responsibility to other believers. Uh, my pastor had a great saying I used to really, in fact, the very first Bible study I ever heard him teach, he made the statement and really resonated with me as a young believer. He said that liberty misused is liberty lost. Liberty abused is liberty lost. And I always thought about that, how that uh, we're given this individual freedom, but if we use it incorrectly, if we misuse that freedom, uh, particularly in using it to fulfill selfish ambitions, uh, we'll end up losing that freedom because we'll become captive of whatever we give ourselves to. In fact, it's the very thing that Paul says in Romans 6, where he tells us that, um, uh, he says, uh, now that we've been saved by Christ, saved by grace, do we continue in sin? And he said, God forbid. He goes on to warn, he says, whatever you yield yourself to serve, you become the servant of that thing. And so the freedom that we've received in Christ is the freedom to follow Christ. We didn't have that before we were saved because of some of the things we'll talk about today, particularly the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But Paul really began in chapter one talking about this exalted position that we as Christians and as the church have in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Being a Christian disconnected from the body of believers is really uh, a place of spiritual unhealthiness. And so you always need to understand that whatever injunctions, imperatives, instructions that Paul puts into his letters, he's viewing them through the lens of the church and this community of believer. And he was very, very excited about it as he talked about a lot in chapter three. But the second thing he brought out in chapter two was the condition of the believers. In other words, we may have this exalted position, but we didn't come to it through our own effort, our own works. Paul would point out that this was really the failing of Judaism of his day. He said that they had a zeal towards God, but they thought that their righteousness would come by their good works. And that's not to discount good works, as Paul said at the end of chapter 2. He says, as followers of Christ, we're ordained by God to walk in good works. But those good works don't qualify us. Those are things we're expected to do. Um, it's kind of like if I turn on the faucet and water comes out. If I turn on cold, it comes out cold. If I turn on hot, it comes out hot. I don't look at the faucet and say, I praise you for the great job you've done. It's merely a conduit for which that water can flow and address the need that it hopefully addresses. And I think the same thing is true about you and me, that we are given this empowerment, this presence of the Holy Spirit. He said that rivers of living water would flow out of us. It's the outflow, the natural outflowing of that water, which really is just the natural consequence of being in relationship with Christ. This really struck me as I was reading through John 15 the other day, and, and Jesus was talking about how that there's just a natural consequence that if we're in him, we will be bear fruit and will bring glory to the Father. That's not something that is extra special or out of the ordinary or unrequired. I've heard people make the argument sometimes that uh, there's two kinds of Christians. There's the saved and then there are disciples. I don't find the Bible makes any kind of distinction whatsoever. It expects, expressly says that if I am in Christ, that I will bear fruit that will give evidence to the fact that Christ is in me. And so that's what he talked about in chapter two, that it's 
it's this grace of God, this, this unmerited favor that God has bestowed upon us that has qualified us for what we're called to. But when it comes to chapter three, this is the what I call Paul's autobi- autobiographical section where he talks about his role in this whole process, that God had chosen him to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles and that the, even the Ephesians who were in the faith now had come through the result of his ministry. And we know that as it tells us in the book of Acts that the gospel spread wide and far in the two years that Paul spent ministering in the city of Ephesus. And churches were planted in many far flung places like Colossia and Philadelphia and so forth. In other words, the seven churches of Revelation were all the consequence of this two year period in which Paul spent ministering in the city of Ephesus. But he also needed to address the issue that there was this schism that existed amongst the believers in the church. Some who were Jews where Paul began his evangelistic work amongst the Jews, uh, preaching to them uh, of Christ. And then he left when the Jews rejected the gospel, went to the school of Tyrannus and began to teach both Jews and Gentiles. And it's interesting, Paul didn't form a new synagogue. He formed something very different from the synagogue. He formed a church. And many times, you know, our Jewish brethren would like to kind of say those guys, those things are basically one and the same, but the function of the synagogue was distinct from the function of the church. The synagogue was a place for prayer and for teaching. But the, church, the, but the temple for the Jew was a place of worship and sacrifice. Well, the church consumes all of that. In the church, the church is not only a place of worship and sacrifice, but it's also a place of teaching and prayer and basically the gathering of the community of believers in one place under one heading. And so it's, it's really important that Paul needed them to understand that there was no Jew and Gentile in the church, but they were one in Christ. Now, Keep in mind, when Paul is writing this letter, the church is both thriving and also being threatened. Paul himself is in prison, and those who are in Ephesus and many other places where Paul had planted churches really had no certainty as to what his fate was going to be. And and when the idea of a prominent leader going off the scene comes, many times that creates a a fear. Uh, Paul himself said to the Corinthians that he lived with threats from without, and he also lived with fears within. And so it's understandable that they would begin to become fearful if they, if they do this to our leader, what's going to be the next consequence? If they execute Paul as a heretic or as a, a blasphemer or anti, um, uh, well, they basically call it atheist because they didn't believe the gods of Rome and making him a political enemy, wouldn't that as a course in course apply to them as well? And so Paul has a real concern. That's why one of the things he said we looked at last week where he says, I ask you therefore not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you. It's not only their hearts being broken to see him suffer, but then becoming discouraged and thinking, are we next? As we recall from the gospel accounts, after Jesus' arrest, his disciples ran away and hid. You know, they locked the doors, shuttered the windows, and said, keep your voice down so nobody will know we're here, because they were terrified that what had just happened to Jesus was also going to happen to them. And that's why Paul, as he ends this third chapter, starts with a prayer. And he says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, out of Christ's or God's glorious riches, that he would really grant them three things. And in a way, we could say there are three things that he hopes they can grasp which is a word that he uses further on, the idea that you really get a hold of it and it's not just something that's resting in your hand, but it's something that you've got a firm grip upon so that nothing can shake it loose. And he refers to really three points of prayer where he says, basically, number one, that you be strengthened with power, that they would be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit. That secondly, he says, I pray that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. And then finally, he says that uh, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power both together with the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this, basically, that you may be filled to the full measure of God. So here we have these three things that he wants them to really grasp. Number one, he wants them to understand uh, that that there's power available for them and where that power comes from. That secondly, uh, that they would 
live by faith and, and not just simply by intellect or even by their own fervor. And then lastly, that that would be something that would be rooted and grounded in the love of God. So the power of the Holy Spirit, faith and love. These are the three things that Paul really want to establish in them. And uh, they're the three things that we're going to begin uh, digging into more deeply when we continue this conversation tomorrow. So I encourage you, read through the rest of chapter three in Ephesians and uh, just see what the Lord speaks to you as you meditate upon these passages. Because as one of the things that John said, you don't need that any man teaches you, but the Holy Spirit will teach you in all things that are necessary. And I believe in that. That's what we call the priesthood of the believer, that every one of us can go individually to Christ and hear his will for us as we look to his word. So God bless you, and we'll pick this up on the other side.